So we're going to be covering some basic biochemistry terminology. A lot of this might feel familiar from middle school. You've probably talked about some of this um, terminology before, especially like atom. An atom is a basic unit of matter, and that just means that everything is composed of atoms. Whether it's a living organism or something that's non-living, atoms are what basically builds everything. And an atom has three smaller parts, and these smaller parts are called subatomic particles. There are electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. The electrons are the smallest subatomic particle, and they are in constant movement around the outside of the atom. Protons and neutrons make up the nucleus, and those are found together in the center of the atom. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons are neutral. They don't have any charge. What keeps an atom together is the attraction between the negative electrons that are flying around in what we call the electron cloud on the outside and the positive nucleus, which is made positive because of the protons that are there. So electron, proton, neutron, we often see diagrams of atoms like this, where the electrons are the ones that are um, in those rings, it's showing that they're constantly moving, and then the protons and the neutrons are in the center. Here we have the periodic table of the elements. Everything in this chart is a different element. And an element is a pure substance of one type of atom. So hydrogen atoms make up hydrogen. Oxygen atoms make up oxygen. Carbon atoms make up carbon. Um, all atoms are slightly different, and those differences are what creates these elements. So here we have three different elements. We have carbon. And so this is showing the carbon atom that makes up carbon. Here we have oxygen. And so that's an oxygen atom. And here's magnesium. And that's a magnesium atom. So you can see the three atoms of the three different elements are very different. And so that gives each element its unique properties. Atomic number. When we look at the periodic table, there's numbers on these different elements. And the atomic number, um, sometimes it's going to be found in different locations. But here, we've got it circled on our carbon element right here. The atomic number tells us how many protons are in that atom. The number of protons never changes. So carbon will always have six protons and that's its atomic number. If we look over here at the element of oxygen, the atomic number for oxygen would be eight, telling us that oxygen always has eight protons. The other number that we see on the periodic table is called the mass number. And the mass number is the mass of the nucleus. Um, we only take into account the mass of the nucleus because protons and neutrons are approximately the same size and they're much larger than electrons. Electrons are so small that they don't really contribute to the mass of the atom. And so when we look at the mass number, we are adding together how many protons and how many neutrons are in that atom. Now, when you look at the numbers like here for carbon, it's 12.100. And what that is, is actually an average. We're gonna talk about something called isotopes in just a little bit. Isotopes are different versions of an atom. And so if we take all these different versions and we average them out together, we're going to get the mass number. Over here, we have oxygen and the mass number is approximately 16. So what this is telling us is that if we add the protons and the neutrons together, we're gonna to get 16. We know that there are eight protons, since that's the atomic number. So if we take our 16 total 
minus eight protons, that tells us that this oxygen atom is going to have eight neutrons. Same over here with carbon. If we take the mass number minus the protons, we're going to end up with six neutrons. Now, here's what I was talking about in terms of an isotope. An isotope is an atom of an element which differs in the number of neutrons. So whenever you think of isotope, think of the neutrons. And when we're looking at isotopes, since they're all a little bit different, we're going to identify them as different by using their mass number. Some isotopes are stable, where they just happen to be a slightly different version of the atom but not really different in any other way. Other isotopes end up becoming radioactive when the number of neutrons is changed. And radioactive means that the nucleus is unstable and it breaks down in a constant rate of time. Now we're gonna talk much more about isotopes second semester because there's lots of practical applications for isotopes. Um, when we talk about fossils, there is an isotope of carbon that we can use to figure out how old fossils and rocks are. Um, in medicine, there are different medications or trackers that they can put in your body that's a radioactive tracker, and then they can follow that through your body and it helps them diagnose different conditions or disorders. So for example, here we have three different isotopes of carbon, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Carbon-12 is considered the normal carbon, where it's got six protons, six neutrons. That's how we get the 12, because that's what's making up the nucleus. And then there's going to be six electrons to balance it out so it's neutral. Okay. Here, we have carbon-13. Now remember, carbon will always have six protons, so that never changes. But since we're carbon-13, we have seven neutrons. We still have the six electrons because it's still a neutral atom. And this version of carbon is non-radioactive. It has an extra neutron, but it pretty much acts the same way as regular carbon does. Now, when we get to this one, radioactive carbon-14, again, protons never change, so we've got six protons. But since we're carbon-14, that means we have to have eight neutrons. And again, we have six electrons, doesn't change. But this, having the eight neutrons, makes this isotope of carbon radioactive. It means that the nucleus is unstable and it's constantly trying to change into a form that's more stable. And that's what makes it radioactive because it's gonna be shooting off these particles from the nucleus trying to get to a stable form. So those are isotopes. Isotopes have different number of neutrons than the norm. Ions is a word that seems to get confused with isotopes, probably because they both start with I, and they both have to do with a different number of something. But with ions, we're talking about a different number of electrons. An ion is an atom that's either somehow gotten an extra electron or somehow lost an electron. So here in the diagram, you can see this atom right here is neutral. We've got six negative electrons, six positive protons, so overall we've got no charge. Here we have six electrons and only five protons. So since there's more electrons, this is going to be a negative charge. And here we have six positive protons and five negative electrons. So that one is going to have an overall positive charge. So if we think about an ion, if we take what we start with as neutral, if it gains an electron, 
if it gets an extra negative, it's now negative. If it loses an electron, it's lost a negative, which means what remains is positive. So that's what an ion is. Ions have to do with electrons. So those have to do with atoms. Now, we can combine atoms together. And when we do that, we end up getting a compound or a molecule. A compound or a molecule is a combination of two or more elements. So water. Water is one of the most important molecules in living things. And water is made of two different kinds of elements. There's oxygen and there's hydrogen. And those are held together by bonds and that's what forms water. If you remember the chemical formula of water, H2O, that tells us how many of each molecule is there or each atom is there. We have H2, so two hydrogen and one oxygen. Now there's different kinds of bonds that can hold compounds and molecules together. And one kind of bond is an ionic bond. So ionic bonds are gonna have to do with ions. So we're dealing with those positive and negative atoms. In an ionic bond, electrons are transferred from one atom to another. And when the electrons are tra transferred, we end up with a positive and we end up with a negative. And then that positive and negative are attracted and come together. And that attraction is what bonds them together. So in this diagram, we have a sodium and we have a chloride. If we have a sodium and a chloride kind of near each other, the sodium is going to give one of its electrons to chloride. So now sodium, since it lost an electron, now is positive. Since chloride gained an electron, it's negative and they're gonna be attracted to each other. And so now that compound is gonna be held together by an ionic bond. And when sodium and chloride come together, we form NaCl, which is table salt, like what you would put on your food. And when those um, atoms are together, they actually form nice little crystalline cubes like this. And so this is what individual molecules of salt would look like under the microscope. So another way of thinking about an ionic bond would be like this, where we have two dogs and one ends up giving its bone to the other, but then they come closer together so that they're both near those bones, okay? So we've got our Na, that gives up his bone to the CL, and then they're attracted to each other that way. That's an ionic bond. So just another way to think about it that might help you visualize this kind of bond in your head. Another kind of bond is a covalent bond. Covalent bonds are the strongest bonds. Once these bonds form, it's very difficult to break them apart. With a covalent bond, the electrons are shared. So it's not like we're giving one to another, we're holding on to them together. So they want to share them at the same time. And so this forms a molecule. Here, when we have carbon surrounded by four different hydrogens, that's called a methane molecule, CH4. So if we're gonna go back to like our dog example again, this would be, Two dogs, they each have their own bone, but then they want to share it. They're not willing to give it up. Each dog wants to still keep the bone it started with, but it also wants to hold on to the other bone. So that's gonna be really strong because neither of them is gonna to want to give it up. So that would be a covalent bond. And then the third type of bond is a hydrogen bond. And hydrogen bonds are a little bit different because these aren't bonding a molecule together, but it's gonna connect 
different molecules together. Um, and so it's usually a hydrogen oxygen bond that's going to almost form a chain of molecules. This is a really weak bond. So it'll hold molecules together, but it's going to be very easy to break apart. And we'll talk a lot more about this um, in the near future when we talk about water, because water is a really huge hydrogen bonding uh, molecule. So here, We've got a water molecule, H2O. Here we have another water molecule, H2O. We'll get into this a little later, but water is what we call polar. And so the oxygen keeps more of the negatives and the hydrogens keep more of the positives. So if we've got a little more negative here and a little more positive here, they're gonna be kind of attracted to each other. The negative and the positive are going to be drawn together. And if you can see this dotted line, that's what's kind of going to hold them together. That is the weak hydrogen bond that if we try, we can easily break those two molecules apart. So those are different ways that atoms and in this case molecules can be held together.